It's, yeah, it's, it's a privilege for me to also be a, a, a team member here with the Lonergan Society. We also we hope to continue to, to drum up support and to get some uh, undergraduates as well as other further graduates uh, involved um, following the legacy that Bob has, has so uh, strongly established here at Marquette and around the world. But it's a, a great privilege for me to welcome uh, a fellow Jesuit and also um, a man in formation, uh, Timothy Perrone, as our first speaker. He is uh, beginning his second year as a PhD student in systematic theology at Fordham University and is, uh, yeah, he is a Jesuit in formation. His interests lie in the theological implications of our increasing understanding of the complexities of gender and sexuality. He has very recently encountered Lonergan's thought and has just begun to think about its potential as a structure that can facilitate the incorporation of biological science studies into the contemporary theological conversation concerning gender and sexuality. And there's no better place to begin to explore Lonergan than here at the Lonergan on the Edge. Um, so, so starting out is rerouting theories of sex, gender toward experience, employing science studies within the structure of Lonergan's transcendental method. Timothy. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and so I guess without further ado, I'll get started. There's currently broad disagreement over claims made by theories of gender and sexuality, raising the question of how they can be assessed. Although Bernard Lonergan is not typically enlisted as a source to grapple with theories of this kind, the general approach of his transcendental method provides a promising starting point for assessing and honing them. Lonergan's method is understood by him to be one that is applicable to all fields of study. In method and theology, he uses the natural sciences as, as a commendable example from which he generalizes in order to explain, broadly speaking, what method is. He defines it as a normative pattern of recurrent and related operations yielding cumulative and progressive results. This implies the verifiability or not that is possible with the continuous intake of data coupled with, with the ability of interpretations to explain that data. Science studies can provide theories of sex and gender with a broader grounding in experience, which in my view is sometimes lacking. This essay's interaction with Lonergan's transcendental method is by no means an in-depth application of it, but rather it provides a basic structure within which science studies and theories of sex and gender can interact on common ground. Within the framework of the transcendental method, this essay will consider science studies in relation to theories of sex and gender and argue that this consideration highlights the importance of verifying such theories by routing them from the realm of theory back to that of experience. The scientific method used by science studies is not a substitute for sex and gender studies, but it can be helpfully applied to them. For instance, science studies represent the experience of a vast number of persons, demonstrating a reality recognizable across multiple people's experience. At the same time, we should keep in mind that the relevant data in science studies concerning the formulation of sex and gender identity and sexual desire is based upon statistical probabilities and is only in this sense determinative. It is not, it does not provide the sole and total explanation of the phenomena in question. Since theories concerning sex and gender are typically thought of in relation to two poles, constructivism and essentialism, this paper considers each pole highlighting Lonergan's stipulation that interpretations flow from experience. Judith Butler is engaged with as a representative view in the area of the constructivist poll, and Pope St. John Paul II as a representative view in the area of the essentialist poll. Science studies will be employed in each case to provide an example of one way in which these studies route both thinkers discussed back to experience to confirm conclusions or indicate the need for some degree of revision in the aspects under consideration. But before embarking on this journey, we will briefly review Lonergan's transcendental method. Unlike the more specific method of the natural sciences that views data only as sense perception, the transcendental method views acts of consciousness as data 
acts which are, of course, bound up with sensory input. Lonergan distinguishes four acts of consciousness that compose his method. First, experiencing entails that one is attentive to the data received through the senses of one's imagining and of conscious acts themselves. Second, understanding requires one to make an inquiry into the data attended to in order for it to be interpreted and conceptualized. Third, judging means that one affirms a particular interpretation through critical reflection, considering the truth or falsehood of that interpretation. And fourth, deciding requires one to be responsible by acting in accord with what one has come to know through experiencing, understanding, and judging. Lonergan's claim is that the transcendental method applies to all disciplines and is irreformable since any revision would need to implement the same transcendental method that was purportedly trying to be re revised. First, let us consider Judith Butler's sex and gender constructivism in the context of Lonergan's transcendental method. While many consider sex to be a biological reality separate from gender, the latter typically being thought of as expressed in various gender roles, Butler considers sex and gender to be a unified reality that is flexible, unfixed. Reacting to criticisms that she did not adequately consider the body as a given reality in her theory on the construction of sex and gender, Butler specifically addressed this concern. In her view, any understanding of the body's materiality is the result of its being viewed through the socially formed conceptual framework that is always already operative when the psyche perceives that materiality. Therefore, the body is never simply perceived, but must always be perceived with preconceived notions, meanings, and purposes, which are intrinsically bound up with that perception. In this sense, Butler argues that the psyche is the, quote, mode by which the body is given, and so can be understood as the condition and contour of that givenness. In a more specific explication of this point, she points to the scientific categories that are used to speak about the body, i.e. biology, anatomy, anatomy, physiology, hormonal and chemical composition, as the, quote, interpretive matrices that condition, enable, and limit the affirmation of bodily materialities. Since the term sex, in Butler's view, always includes these interpretive matrices, it is a construction and not simply a given reality. Butler discusses the process by which our preconceived notions come to be with respect to both the formation of sex and gender identity and homosexual desire. The two are clearly related to one another since, in order for homosexuality to exist at all, the category of sex must be broadly recognized. This takes place by way of a norm being established through a historical process of frequent discursive iteration, by which she means a, repeti a repetition in language, to the degree that the history of the norm's establishment becomes masked. The norm, Butler thinks, becomes understood as natural, hardwired into human beings. One of the most prominent of these norms is that of certain individuals being viewed as males and others as females. This identification starts to be thought of as part of the nature of being human. Further, the norm of heterosexual relations between the identities of male and female also starts to be thought of as natural to humans. What Butler refers to as citationality occurs in the process of the reiteration of norms. These norms are cited, meaning that they are used in language, to the point that they are comprehended as a kind of law. Lonergan's transcendental method is able to take to heart Butler's point that preconceptions play a key role in our understanding of sex and gender, but also carries this point from the realm of theory back to the data of experience in order to, to test the degree of its applicability. The role of judgment entails critically examining any interpretation of the body by, by moving between that interpretation and ongoing experience in order to test whether or not one's judgment best accounts for the experience. To this end, we may ask, what experiences can be highlighted to verify the conclusion, central to Butler's argument, that the reiteration in language of the categories male, female, and heterosexuality is the primary reason for the existence of these categories? 
the mere facts that there is reiteration, that these reiterations function normatively, and that other conceptions are not viewed as socially acceptable in many contexts are all important observations of broadly occurring experiences that are undeniably operative. But does their influence translate into being the cause of these normative conceptions of sex and gender? In my view, science studies help us to address this question. If the normativity of heterosexual categories are merely the effects of reiteration, we should expect radically different normativities in different cultures. While it is true that there is some variance interculturally, one would be hard pressed to argue that heterosexuality is not the norm of the vast majority of cultures. Rates of homosexuality are quite similar in cross-cultural comparisons as well. For example, one study conducted on the sexual orientation of adult males from cultures with both restrictive attitudes towards homosexuality and those with more accepting attitudes does not show great differences in the rate of homosexual orientation despite different norms. Science studies on intersex persons who have a condition known as congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH, provide a particularly illuminative example from which to critically investigate experience in order to provide an interpretation. Persons with CAH have most of the structures traditionally associated to call it traditionally understood to constitute female sex and appear externally as such, with the difference that, because they're exposed to high amounts of androgens or male typical hormones in the womb, they experience some degree of genital variance. Historically, these persons' genitalia have been most often modified at birth to make them female typical. Additionally, they have usually been given androgen suppressants from birth onwards and raised as females. Often, they themselves were never made aware of, were met, never made aware or never become aware of their intersex condition. Since they are taken to be females by society and raised as such, according to Butler's theory, one would expect them to fit the norms of those whom the culture recognizes as female or at least only diverge from these norms at a rate similar to others in the same culture who are subject to them. But the recorded data of experience gives evidence to the contrary. About 37% of persons with CAH identify as homosexual or bisexual, a rate that is two to three times higher than women of the general population. Further, one recent study found that they have a weaker female gender identity than a control population of women. In addition, CAH children were shown to prefer to play with toys, engage in aggressive play, and draw pictures in a way more similar to boys in comparison with a control population of girls. For the purposes of this study, it is important to recognize the greater percentage among persons with CAH who experience differences from control populations of females regarding the sexual identity and sexual desire at high, higher percentages. These differences cannot be the product of reiterated norms because from a social perspective, these persons are subject to the same cultural forces as others whom society understands to be female. Yet they break from, that, from those norms with greater frequency than others in the same sexed, gendered social category. If we take the conclusions of the studies on CAH persons and the cross-cultural comparison of sexual orientation together, both suggest that the reiteration of sex and gender identities and commonly associated desires must be interpreted as having a limited capacity to explain the data of experience. Applying Lonergan's transcendental method to judge any interpretation as true one must account for the evidence presented here that indicates variances in sex and gendered identities and sexual desire that the force of the reiteration of norms cannot explain. This evidence does not exclude Butler's theory as an operative force, but points to causes of sex and gender identity and sexual desires that are based in bodily materialities that could very well be acting in conjunction with societal norms. 
The essentialism of Pope St. John Paul II conveys a straightforward binary view and a theological key. He treats sex, and sex as a duality that is overlaid and integrated with gender so that sex and gender are inseparably connected to each other. In a series of talks by John Paul that became, have become known as Theology of the Body, he states that the human body carries within itself the signs of sex and is by its nature male or female. For John Paul, the term sex cannot be seen simply as pertaining to the body, but as a sign of a deeper reality of masculinity and femininity, which are, quote, two ways in which the same human being created in the image of God is a body. While the emphasis is placed upon person's interior creation identity as either masculinity or femininity, the body is a concrete marker of these invisible realities, and hence is quite important in his theological anthropology. It is so important, in fact, that consciousness of one's own male or female body and sexuality, quote, establishes an inalienable norm for the understanding of man, the human person, on the theological plane. Clearly, the claims of John Paul makes about the body are beyond the scope of science studies insofar as they are theological. But insofar as they pertain to the empirical reality of the body, they are within the scope of these studies. As with Butler, intersex science studies are instructive here. While any intersex condition would not neatly conform to John Paul's understanding of sex and gender as a binary, androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS, is a case that particularly reveals the impossibility of the application of the binary in the form he expresses. XY individuals, typically understood as male, who have AIS lack the receptors required for testosterone to take effect. These results in the, the res, this results in these persons appearing to be female externally in every way, but internally they have male sex organs including testes that are, un, un, that are undescended. This also means, of course, that they do not menstruate. The application of Lonergan's method leads to the question of how one could interpret a person's interior sex and gender identity as being either masculine or feminine when their bodily reality does not admit of being neatly characterized as male or female. The data of experience supplies us with complexities that exceed the interpretive capability of John Paul's theory of sex and gender. At the same time, attentiveness to the data of experience does not lead to a complete trivialization of the categories of male and female. As mentioned above, science studies on sex and gender dealt with here are concerned with statistical probabilities. Jonathan Heaps and Neil Omerode have applied Lonergan's metaphysics, which is based upon statistical probability, to the variances in sex, gender, and sexual desire. A key point in their article is that, by understanding these sexualities statistically, when what is less probable occurs, this does not constitute the destruction of what is normative in accord with statistical likelihood. Intersex conditions would not necessitate judging John Paul's interpretation of sex and gender to be irrelevant, but would call for it to be incorporated into a more complex interpretive matrix. Lonergan's transcendental method calls both Judith Butler's and Pope St. John Paul II's theories of sex and gender to be accountable to the experiences represented in science studies for our consideration. As we have seen above, in different ways, in different ways, both of these thinkers articulate interpretations of sex and gender in such a way as to hold them back from those that more accurately conceptualize experience, and so are, in this sense, suggested by experience to our reasoning faculty. Of course, Lonergan's transcendental method is not merely concerned with empirical data, nor does data itself give us an interpretation. Rather, it is in reflecting on various interpretations that persons can make more or less accurate judgments with respect to the data of experience. But this emphasis on experience, in my view, is much needed if those who hold different theories of sex and gender are going to have common ground upon which to propose different interpretations. 
For the field of theology, this is of utmost importance. Theological anthropology is often closely related to one's conception of God and vice versa. For example, emphasis on the human person as an inherently social being is reflected in the emphasis of many theologians' view on the social nature of the Trinity. Because of this kind of correspondence, one cannot dismiss diverging views of gender and sexuality in the church as less important than, for, for example, dogmatic claims that diverge over conceptions of God or have other major dogmas that have traditionally been understood as more essential than sex and gender claims. Indeed, Christian communions have even split over competing claims regarding sexuality. Lonergan's insightful method may have the potential to foreground experiences in such a way as to bring those with differing sex and gender inspired theological anthropologies into productive conversation and to help them to find significant common ground. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Timothy. Are there any questions? And if, the, if so, either uh, you can raise your hand or put something in the text box. Steve, thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, Timothy. That was really great. Um, I'm wondering if you um, could share a little bit of your own thoughts on kind of um, uh, some of the question of, uh, and you, you've you kind of covered this, but your understanding of um, normativity and how to hold together the idea that there there may be something that is uh, normative, a particular. Um, heteronormativity, for instance, uh, heterosexuality, but but uh, holding that intention with um, the reality that not not everything conforms to a certain normativity, and that is also part of reality, right? So to say that something is normative isn't to say that it's the only potential path or the only reality, um, and yet I think that's what a lot of times happens in the discussion is either, you know, I think this is kind of what you're, you're, you're getting at. Either you say this is normative, this is the majority, so this is the only way, or we say, no, there's other examples. And so we can't say that anything is normative or that there's any majority way because it's all up for grabs. And uh, uh, my understanding is you're kind of trying to use Lonergan to kind of uh, moderate those. But I was wondering if you could just talk about that maybe also in terms of the you know, the discussion in society that, that comes up around those issues. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that's precisely what I was, uh, one of the things that I was trying to do. And one of the things that I see as a, a position that's totally sensible, but um, I think uh, some of the comments that were uh, made prior to me starting really speak to the fact that, you know, there's, there's just a divisiveness that pushes people in one direction or the other in our in our contemporary society. Um, so yeah, I, I think that one way to hold them together is to look at sort of the statistical, um, you know, probabilities that are that occur cross culturally, as I was as I was talking about. And I mean, if we can see that there are these sort of statistical ways that uh, people gravitate towards in terms of their sexuality and their sexual identity. Um, then maybe we can understand that these normativities are not just simply, you know, norms operating and are also not simply just sort of um, a hard and fixed reality, uh, but that it's, uh, th that it's a complex reality that we don't totally understand, but that there's a normativity that kind of cuts through, um, you know, perspectives that might want to pin uh, gender and sex identification um, simply on, you know, biology or simply on sort of these social norms that's a, a total construction. So I think Lonergan is helpful in the sense that he allows us to uh, 
kind of see normativity in a more um, broad way or in a more diversified way, um, so to speak. Um, and actually, I mean, Jonathan Heap's article really speaks to this point particularly, and he draws this out in Lonergan um, in, in a wonderful article. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's what I, would, what I would say about that. Thank you. We do have a few other moments if anybody would like to offer a question. Well, thank you, Timothy. It, it yeah, this is uh, it's it's brave that you took on the topic that you and that you came to came to Lonergan on the edge and, and, and shared this. So I, we greatly appreciate your exploring these ideas. It sounds like there is this, as Lonergan would say, there's a there's a dialectic here between the normativity and then like the possibilities of of greater exploration of who we are as human persons. Yes. Thank so you thank for having you me. Much. My pleasure to be here. <laughs>